Well, it's about bloody time. Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome back to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. I am so jazzed to be talking about this movie. If you didn't see from the thumbnail or the title, today we are talking about Barbarian, which was released in the US back in September, I think, but has only just only just been released in the UK. I had no idea this movie was even a thing a few months ago, but I discovered it when I was researching horror movies that were still to be released this year for an episode here on the channel. As soon as I heard about it, Barbarian became a highly anticipated movie on my watch list. And I don't even really know why, because I didn't really know that much about it apart from one of its cast members. And I'd also seen the very opening scene in the trailer where Tess rings the doorbell and the guy answers as I had put that in the um, still to come episode. I was gutted when we heard it was going to be a very delayed release here in the UK, especially as when it was released in the US, people were just gushing about this movie. It was a painful wait, but the wait is over and I've finally seen Barbarian. And honestly, it was everything I hoped for and more. I loved Barbarian. It's certainly one of my favorites, well, favorite horror movies of the year. I usually do a positives and negatives breakdown in my movie reviews, but now and then there's a movie where I just want to talk about it and that's what I'm going to do with Barbarian. Also, I am going to include spoilers as I feel it's been out long enough now that most people have probably seen it, um, but if you haven't, then that's your warning. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend you go see it. Okay, so let's just get started. Let's just talk about this awesome movie. Barbarian was written and directed by Zach Krager, Krager, I'm terrible with names, who I hadn't heard of, but is apparently part of a comedy troupe in the US called The Whitest Kids You Know. This is Krager's directorial debut, which is awesome. What an incredible debut. Barbarian was made with a budget of $4.5 million and has so far made $43.3 million worldwide. It stars Georgina Campbell and horror royalty Justin Long and Bill Skarsgård. A young woman discovers the rental home she booked is already occupied by a stranger. Against her better judgment, she decides to spend the night, but soon discovers there's a lot more to fear than just an unexpected house guest. Barbarian is an incredibly well-made horror movie. It's a well-made movie full stop. They know how to place a camera and frame a shot. They kind of do it in a way that makes the audience do some of the work. There are so many shots where there's a doorway or a corridor just off to the side in the dead space and you don't know whether to watch the focal point where the action is or to watch the bit off to the side in anticipation of something scary happening. The sound design in this is a masterpiece. I'm not sure the film would be as effective without it, although that's probably the case with most movies. Um, it had a wonderful blend of highlighting everyday sounds like rain falling, wine being poured, or a tape measure with really unnatural, creepy sounds. Like in the opening scene, there's this odd wailing over the visual, but then as it moves into the car with Tess, it changes to just the rain hitting the car window. The soundtrack is also pretty strong. You've got Ricky Ticky Tavi by Donovan and the choice to roll credits to Be My Baby by the Renettes was just pure genius. It just allows you to decompress for a moment and try to figure out what it is that you've just watched. The structure of the film at first felt a little jarring to me. It's an unusual structure. It's a purposeful structure. Um, it has its three acts, but these are distinguished by the jumps in the narrative. Very dramatic, very sharp jumps. The first jump is linear, moving the story forward a few weeks, but the next jump is a flashback of Frank in the 1980s. But it's the combination of the jump in narrative, which I wasn't expecting with the timing of the jump and what we jump from to. Um, like we jump from the dungeon from hell to the bright sunny coastline of California. At the time, this absolutely threw me. I mean, you've just witnessed Keith's head pulverized against the wall and now you're watching AJ sing along to Ricky Tikki Tavi. But I get that these jumps act as a moment of decompression for the audience, like the, um, the credits. They're a chance for you to reset 
because you need them. From the moment Bill Skarsgård's Keith goes down into the basement, I'm not kidding, everything was clenched. I was on edge for so much of this film and it was exhausting. With the jarring structure and cuts comes a very clear three act film. The first act is following Tess and Keith in the Airbnb. The second act is following AJ as he's accused of SA and goes to the house. And the third act is Tess and AJ in the tunnels and then the final showdown between them and the movie's monster. I love the first act because, well, first of all, Bill Skarsgård and Georgina Campbell are wonderful in their roles and an absolute joy to spend time with, but also because at this point in the film, we don't know what the horror is. We don't know um, when it'll start or where it'll come from. And so while I'm enjoying the awkward and frosty interactions between Tess and Keith turn into awkward, but sweet and funny interactions, I was also always on the alert for when the horror was going to kick in. I also think that Barbarian does a great job of making you wary of the character of Keith. Perhaps that was helped by the fact that we've seen Skarsgård play villains before, but I got to the point where I was convinced he was a part of whatever was going to happen, especially when he's gone down into the basement and he's calling for help. But of course we learn in a very brutal way that Keith is in fact just a really sweet guy. But even when I still thought he was up to something, I still enjoyed his nervous energy and chivalry, even if sometimes it was a little misjudged. His character brought a lot of humour to the film, like when he's rambling on about making tea, or when he's just sat creepily at the table. <laughs> when the camera moves, he's just sat at the table with the bottle of wine and the two glasses. And I love how they also add the little detail that he's reading Jane Eyre, just to emphasise that he's sensitive, but um, also a nice little joke there, because now I don't want to spoil the story for people, but it is a 170 year old text, so you know. In Jane Eyre, Mr. Rochester's wife is locked in the attic because she is mentally ill. So there's a little parallel there between that and what we discover later in the movie. Poor Keith. I mean, <laughs> poor Keith. I also think that Tess is a really good and well-written character. She is the woman whose eyes we see through in terms of the movie's message about men and women and how they experience the world differently. Tess is another example of a woman making smart decisions, which we're seeing portrayed more and more in horror movies. Tess asks Keith to show her his confirmation of the booking. She takes a photo of his ID in his wallet. She's very unsure about coming into the house and then again unsure about staying there. When she goes down into the basement and finds the creepy door, she nopes out of it. But she's not a cold person who just hates men. She's depicted as reading her situation and acting accordingly. We see that she softens to Keith after they've talked for a bit, she starts to relax with him. I loved the bit where Keith has come back and he's helped Tess get out of the basement and she's frantic, scared, and she's telling him that they need to leave. And Keith just tells her to calm down and that it's okay, you're safe. And Tess replies calmly, no, I don't think I am. This got me thinking about a lecture I went to a couple of months ago. It was on the psychology of serial killers and the lecturer, I forget her name now, she spoke about our gut reaction being a genuine thing, how it's our brains reading warning signs and telling us something is wrong, whether that's a certain person or a certain situation. The example she gave was of a woman called Cheryl Bradshaw who was a bachelorette on the dating game. Cheryl had chosen her bachelor, but after spending time with him backstage, she refused to go on the date with him because she thought he was creepy and felt like something was off. The bachelor turned out to be Rodney Alcala, an American serial killer who at this point had already attacked and killed multiple females, both children and adults. The lecturer also talked about a book called The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker, which is a self-help book that helps you read survival signals to help you protect yourself from potentially violent situations. And while I was watching this film, especially this scene, it made me think of this. And it turns out that Zach Kreger, Kreger, sorry, the writer and director read this book, The Gift of Fear, and that's where the inspiration for this movie came from. I love it. I just, I love this movie the more I think about it and the more that I find out about it. I mean, that's the message of Barbarian, that men and women experience the world in very different ways. How men can go into situations almost head on, while women are far more cautious and assess potential dangers all of the time. 
And while nine times out of the 10, it's fine, we are still always reading these signals. The scene where Keith and Tess are talking over wine addresses this by having Tess explained that she would have never let Keith in, like he let her in, had their roles been reversed in the situation. Another great example of this difference being shown is how we have one scene repeated, but with different characters. When Tess walks down the stairs into the tunnels, she's terrified. She's crying, whimpering, calling out for Keith. She's afraid of her environment and walks very slowly through it. We see AJ do the exact same thing later on, except he walks down into the tunnels calmly and confidently. I mean, he says what the f a few times, but he's so chilled that he's still using his tape measure to measure the square foot. Before he goes down into the tunnels, he even says something like, you got this, I'm a man, I'm gonna mess you up, you know, pumping himself up. But I'm jumping ahead here, so back to the first act. After leading us to not trust Keith, they pull a psycho on us and kill off one of the leads and then shift the focus onto a new character. Barbarian isn't the first movie to do what it did, but it is the first time I have experienced the shock of it. I think most people who watch Psycho or Scream for the first time now go into it knowing that twist of killing off Marion and Casey. So while this was a shocking move, I loved that I experienced the actual shock of it. Act two for me is the funniest part of the film for sure and it comes from Justin Long's brilliant performance. I mean, even though it becomes clear who this guy is and how the movie wants you to dislike him, he's still friggin' hilarious. All of his actions in the house are great, like his reaction to finding people's belongings in the house and how he just frisbees Tessie's laptop. But the scene where he found the secret room, this disgusting, gross, clearly nefarious room just killed me. Instead of being disgusted, he Googles if the space can be classed as extra space on the house or something like that. Basically seeing if he can sell the house for more money. And then we see him using a tape measure around the gross room, um, along the creepy ass tunnels, and even around these grotty dog cages. It's just brilliant. When we first meet AJ, I don't think it's 100% clear if he did what he's accused of. There is a genuine look of horror on his face, although to be fair, he does seem more bothered by the pilot potentially being dropped than what he's actually accused of but his dialogue, certain words he uses and his actions, they show us very clearly who he is. The way he hangs up on his mum while she's saying I love you, how he treats Keith and Tess's belongings and how he speaks about the woman who has accused him. We even get as near to a confession as we're going to get when he gives his mate his side of the story. And his perception of it is interesting because while it's clear to us from what he's saying that he did do it, his take is that while she said no at first, she just needed a little persuading and that he's a persistent guy. So AJ is the type of guy who doesn't think Think he's a bad guy. He's not plotting to go out and cause harm like another character in the movie which we'll talk about in a moment. Towards the end of the movie, AJ even battles with the question of am I a bad person or am I a good person who did a bad thing? And for a moment, the movie makes you question it too, but only for a moment because his next course of action makes it very clear. There are multiple parallels and contrasts drawn between AJ and other characters in the film. So, while AJ has done bad things, like I said, he doesn't see himself as that guy. But Frank, the man who made the secret room tunnels, he goes out to purposely cause harm to women. He plans, he stalks, he kidnaps, and he holds hostage. There's that terrifying scene where he follows a woman home from the grocery store, gains entry, to her house simply because he's dressed as a workman and then all he does is he unlocks her bathroom window so that he can return later and leaves. When AJ later finds Frank and sees his videotapes of him attacking the women, AJ is horrified by it and says, what the hell is wrong with you? But while it may not have been done in the same way, AJ has still done exactly what Frank did. They're just on different parts of the scale. Is that the right way to say it? 
But then Keith also acts as the opposite end of the scale to both AJ and Frank in terms of toxic masculinity. And that's one of the things I love so much about this movie is that it's not trying to offend men. It's not trying to offend women. I don't think it's attacking either. It's just highlighting certain things through a really solid, well-balanced depiction. What Zack Krieger created with Barbarian is what I think men was going for. I read a review online that someone wrote um, where they said that Barbarian did what men couldn't. And I have to agree, in men, the female lead is pretty much her trauma and that's all. And that's also why she's wary of men. And it's a very broad portrayal of toxic masculinity that doesn't say much more than men bad. But Krieger manages to perfectly capture how some situations, just everyday situations can feel for women while not dumping all over his own gender to do it. The third act of the movie is just nasty in quite a few ways. Um, it opens with another one of those jump cuts, this time the flashback to the 80s where we meet Frank. Frank is the guy who made the gross room and we follow him as he gets supplies for a birth, um, but also puts in place a plan to kidnap the next woman. Then we jump back to Tess and AJ in the pit and we get our proper introduction to the mother. We see Tess's escape from the house, AJ meeting older Frank, the policemen not listening to or willing to help Tess, and the final showdown of the movie. I will say that for me, the third act was my least favourite, but that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it or didn't like it. It's just that I felt it was slightly weaker than the previous two. I found it a little odd that the movie's monster, so to speak, is actually just a victim herself. She's the product of Frank's actions. She has been locked up in the tunnels her whole life and so she hasn't really had any experience of or exposure to life outside of that. But having said that, I think that there are nice little touches in the film that do say, look, she's not the real evil here. The homeless guy explains to Tess that the mother isn't the worst thing in the house, meaning Frank is, and there are some parallels between AJ and the mother, most notably in the final act where Tess and AJ have run up the water tower to escape the mother who has chased them from the house. And we've just watched as AJ literally throws Tess off the roof so that he can survive. Okay, so question answered. He's not a good guy who did a bad thing. He's a bad guy. But in contrast to that is the mother jumping off the tower after Tess to save her. It's been a while since a movie left me feeling all kinds of things. I think probably not since I watched Ari Aster's movies earlier this year. I mean, it's not in the same vein, but I definitely had to decompress after Barbarian ended. But I don't think it was quite as wild as some people have made it out to be. When it was released, there was a lot of talk of it being the wildest horror movie in ages and how you just won't believe it. But my worry with that is that while people going into the film may not know anything about it, they are at least going to have a certain level of expectation and the twist may not be as shocking or wild for them. And then instead of being shocked, they're more likely to be disappointed. I wasn't disappointed, I loved this movie, but it wasn't what I was expecting from the hype. Not that I don't want people to be hyped about this movie. This movie came out of nowhere. It is an incredible film and I'm so pleased that people have enjoyed it and want to encourage other people to watch it and want to gush about it. Um, but I have seen some people disappointed by it and I do wonder if it comes from the hype set in certain expectations for them. Okay guys, so that's my long-winded review of Barbarian. I hope I didn't ramble too much. I have been filming for half an hour. Um, I just wanted to gush about this film. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on Barbarian. I'm really excited to talk about this movie with you guys. I'm not quite sure what my next episode will be, but make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it, whatever it may be. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys. <laughs>